Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video we're going to talk about the price to book ratio. These are the topics we're going to cover in this video. First, we're going to start off with a high level, then do a simple calculation of price to book. What is book value? That's the denominator of the equation, B. I'll show you a personal balance sheet, how to interpret the price to book, price to book by industry, by country, the S&P price to book over time, and then a summary. There's two ways to calculate the price to book. The first is you could take the market cap divided by the equity. The market cap can be found on any financial website. That's how much the company's worth according to the stock market. And the equity is on the balance sheet. If you want to calculate it, it's total assets minus total liabilities. It's the book value of the company, how much the company's worth according to its balance sheet. Another way to calculate the price to book is take the stock price over equity per share. To calculate equity per share, it's annual equity over shares outstanding. If someone said Apple is trading at 30 times book value, that just means Apple's price to book is 30. The whole point of price multiples, it helps you compare companies of different sizes. Like the price to earnings, price to sales, price to book, it enables you to compare companies that are large cap against small cap companies or against mid cap. Also using the price to book, it helps you analyze the company over a period of time. And the price to book metric is ideal for valuing banks and insurance companies. If your friend asked you, what is the price to book? Can you tell me in one sentence? You can just say it compares a company's market value to its book value. Let me show you a simple calculation of price to book. First, you need the market cap. That's just a stock price times the shares outstanding. Say it's 300 million for this company. And then you need their equity for the trailing 12 months. And you can find that on the balance sheet. It's assets minus liabilities. Say that's 100 million. So the price to book for this company is three, 300 million over 100 million, market cap over equity. So if you invested in this company, you'd be paying $3 for $1 book value. The equity only changes quarterly when a company issues their financials but the market cap changes all the time throughout the trading day. If this company's market cap doubled from 300 million to 600 million, now their price to book is six, 600 million over 100 million. So it's more expensive to buy the company. You're paying $6 for $1 of equity. And then say a month later, the stock crashes. Now it's down to 200 million. The price to book is two. Now the stock is cheaper. It's more of a discount than when you originally looked at it. So the two numbers you need are the market value and the book value. Everybody knows what market value is because it's talked about all the time. But some people don't really understand what book value is or even where to find it. When you hear book value or carrying value, that just refers to a company's balance sheet. A few decades ago, accounting was just known as bookkeeping. And that's why they call it book value because the bookkeeper would be keeping track of the books. They were physical books where you would write each transaction into. Now we don't really use books anymore. We use programs like QuickBooks. It's all on a computer. So bookkeeping is still a term that's used today, but it's not as common as it used to be. I'm sure you heard the term cooking the books. That just means manipulating the financials to make them look better than they really are. When someone says book value, they may be referring to one particular asset on the balance sheet. Someone may say, what's the book value of this building? That's just the original purchase price minus accumulated depreciation. Say a company bought a building for $100 million. That $100 million goes onto the balance sheet and that's the book value. Each year they depreciate the asset onto the income statement. Say they depreciate it over 10 years, $10 million a year. So after 12 months of owning the building, when you look on the balance sheet, the book value is 90 million. You see 100 million for building and negative 10 million for accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation is a contra asset account. After two years, you look on the balance sheet and the book value of the building is 80 million. After 10 years, the book value is zero. That doesn't mean the building goes away. That just means the accounting value for that building is zero but they can still use that building for many, many more years. But in this video, we're looking at the price to book ratio. So when I say book, I'm referring to equity. 
the value of the entire balance sheet. So book value of a company's equity is their net assets, assets minus liabilities. But if you want to be a really good analyst, try to understand book value in this sense. The way to calculate it is sum up all the stock issuances. So how much money the company raised in their IPO and how much they raised in subsequent offerings. Then sum up all their historical profits. So you might have to go back 20, 30, 40, 100 years. Minus all their losses. The place you find profits and losses is on the bottom of the income statement. It's called net income or net loss. Then you minus all the dividends the company has ever paid out. Then you minus all the share buybacks. So every time they bought back stock. And this is a really important way to think about book value. Because if you look on the balance sheet for a company and their liabilities are greater than their assets, that means they have negative book value and you cannot calculate the price to book for that company because you can't have a negative price to book. And some people assume negative equity is a terrible thing and that means a company can go bankrupt any day. That could be true, but there are some companies like Boeing and Starbucks that have negative equity and it's because they buy back so much stock. If a company has negative equity because they buy back stock, I would say that's not a terrible thing. That's more of a neutral thing. But if a company has negative equity because they have so much losses year after year, they're always losing money. I think that's a bad thing. That's a big red flag. The reason your equity goes down when you buy back stock is because the company uses cash to purchase the stock. On the flip side, you can inflate your equity by issuing lots and lots of stock. So if a company has high equity because they keep issuing stock and diluting shareholders, that could be a bad thing. If you want to do a more conservative price to book calculation, you can strip out intangible assets and just calculate the tangible book value. So you would remove goodwill, patents, trademarks, copyrights, etc. We'll talk more about this later. I'm going to show you a calculation of a regular price to book and the same company, their tangible price to book. One way to really help you understand the balance sheet is create your own personal balance sheet. This will force you to learn things quicker. So take all your assets and try to set it up like a regular US company would set up their balance sheet. The first asset is the most liquid and the last asset is the least liquid. So the cash in your bank account, that's 10,000. Then your retirement account, that's 40,000. You have a car, you have to find out the value of the car and the value of your home. Your bank account is the most liquid because the definition of liquid is cash. So cash is 100% liquid. The way to think about it is the more liquid an investment, the easier it is to turn into cash and the least liquid, the harder it is to turn into cash. Then there's your retirement account. You could turn that into cash in a few days, maybe a week. Of course, you do have to pay a penalty if you do so. Then your car, that could take you a few weeks to turn into cash. You have to find a buyer. Then your home, that could take you a few months, maybe a year to find a buyer and go through the paperwork. And then you want to list your liabilities. On top will be the liability that's due the earliest and on the bottom the liability that's due the latest. So on top would be your credit cards because that's due each month. Then you have a school loan that is due each month, but the maturity date is in five years. Then you have a mortgage, which is due each month, but the maturity is 30 years. So that belongs on the bottom. So your liabilities are 90,000. We're going to assume that when you sell the home, you'll be able to get $130,000 after paying for all the fees. But then in order to release a title, you have to give $50,000 to the bank since they have a lien on the house. And once you do that, then you have $80,000 left over. So your personal balance sheet has $200,000 in assets minus 90,000 liabilities. So you have $110,000 of equity. And you should create this and update it each month and try to come up with creative ways to value your car. Valuing a home is a lot easier. You can just look for a home that's sold in your neighborhood that has similar characteristics as yours. A car may be a little more difficult. You could look at the Kelly Blue Book value but that doesn't mean you'll be able to sell it for that price. Now that we talked about the B, the book value part of the price to book ratio, let's go back to learning about the price to book. How do you interpret a company's price to book? Well, a high price to book could mean the stock is overvalued. 
It could also mean investors are expecting big growth in the future for the company. Where a low price to book could mean the stock is undervalued or that investors fear the company may be in trouble. You always want to compare the price to book to similar companies and also to the same company over time. Say for instance company X has a price to book of 3 and the industry average is 5. So this would imply company X is better at turning investment dollars into equity than its peers. The way I think about price to book is if a company immediately went bankrupt, how much money you would get. And this is all theoretical because a company wouldn't file for bankruptcy unless they were in a lot of trouble. Say you're looking at a company that's trading at $10 per share and if they filed bankruptcy and had a price to book of 10, you would get $1. You would get 10% of your investment. That $1 will be left over for you after the company liquidated its assets and paid down its liabilities. If they had a price to book of two, you would get half your investment back. You would get $5 for each share of stock you owned. If they had a price to book of one, you would get your entire investment back, all $10. And if the company had a price to book of 0.5, you would get double your investment back. So in this case, the company is worth more in bankruptcy than as an operating entity. Of course, this is all theoretical. The company may not be able to get as much for its assets as its balance sheet indicates. Now let's compare two companies side by side using the price to book. Let's pretend we're considering investing in company A or B. Company A has a market cap of 200 billion, so they're a pretty big company and their equity is 60 billion, so their price to book is 3.3. They're trading at 3.3 times book value. So if you want to get a little more information on the company, you could look at what this 60 billion dollars represents. We look at their balance sheet, we see they have cash of 75 billion, so that's a lot of cash. It's nearly 40% of their market cap. And they have some goodwill, 5 billion of goodwill, so their total assets are 80 billion. They have 15 billion of accounts payable, 5 billion of notes payable, so 20 billion of liabilities. If you're curious what the difference is between accounts payable and notes payable. So if you buy products on credit from your supplier, that's accounts payable. They usually give you terms like 60 days to pay. And you don't pay interest on accounts payable. It's kind of like a loan. A company is giving you products before they're getting paid. And this helps you manage your cash. Because when you sell to customers, they don't always pay on time. Sometimes you have to give them terms as well. What if one of your biggest customers is Walmart and they take a long time to pay, up to six months? So you ask your supplier, can you give me longer terms? Can I pay in six months instead of two months? And your supplier says, it's a little difficult to give you that long of terms because we have a lot to pay in payroll, and we have rent, we have a lot of expenses. But you really plead with your supplier, just please give me six months. And they say, okay, we can give you six months, but we have to charge you interest. We'll charge you an annual interest rate of 5%. So if you pay us in six months, that's half a year. So that's two and a half percent interest on whatever we sold to you. And you think about it and you say, that's pretty good because my bank charges 6%, on short-term loans, so I'll take it. So if your supplier starts charging you interest, then that's part of notes payable, that dollar amount, not accounts payable. Also bank loans and loans from investors, that's all part of notes payable as well. Now let's go back to comparing the two companies. Let's look at company B. We notice they have the same exact market cap, 200 billion as company A, and the same equity, 60 billion, like company A. So they both have the same price to book, so it makes no difference which company you invest in. They're both trading at 3.3 times book value. But you really need to look underneath the hood of the car and understand what you're getting. So when we look at their balance sheet, we notice they have a lot of goodwill, 55 billion of goodwill. And company A had 5 billion of goodwill. And I'm not saying goodwill is a bad thing, because goodwill is the premium you pay when you acquire another company. So when you acquire companies, it could help you grow and scale your business a lot faster. But company B has a lot less cash compared to company A. They still have 25 billion of cash, which is pretty good because they have 20 billion of liabilities, so they can cover their liabilities. But what if the capital markets freeze up and it's a lot harder to get funding? Let's say stocks are going down, less people are investing, 
and it's harder to get a loan from the bank. These type of events occur a lot during difficult times like the Great Depression, the Great Recession, the dot-com boom, and even now as the market is struggling a little bit. So oftentimes you don't know the bad companies until there's a really dramatic event. Like Ponzi schemes can go on forever as long as more and more people are willing to invest in that scheme. But once investors start to dry up, then the scheme is revealed. Madoff scheme lasted a long time, but it fell apart in 2008-2009 during the Great Recession. That's why I like that quote by Warren Buffett, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. The same thing when investing, only when things get difficult do you really notice the problems. But if we wanted to take a more conservative approach, we can use a tangible price to book. The tangible equity for company A is 55 billion. Their equity is 60 billion, but we cannot include the 5 billion of goodwill, so we minus that out. So they have 55 billion of tangible equity. So their tangible book value is 200 over 55, 3.6, which is a little worse than 3.3. It's not much different. But company B, we can see a big difference. We see their tangible book value is 40, which is a lot different than 3.3. So you'd have to pay 40 times tangible book value for the company. Here's a chart of the price to book by industry. You can see some industries have a price to book below one. The insurance industry is a good industry to use the price to book ratio. Software companies might not be as ideal, but you always want to compare your company to the industry to see whether your company is over or undervalued. Here's the price to book by country. And a lot of these numbers don't make too much sense. There's a bunch of countries with a price to book of 0.1, but there's only one firm representing that country. Why do these companies trade at such a huge discount? It's because of that country that company is located in. The risk isn't necessarily with the company, it's with the country. So that's why I generally stick to developed countries like United States, UK, Canada, Germany, when I invest in stocks. This is the S&P 500 the last 22 years, the average price to book. It was over five in 2000. Then the dot-com crash, a lot of dot-coms with inflated book values went bankrupt and the price to book came way down. It did come up a lot recently, it was over 4.5. It has come down a bit the past few months but the market still seems to be overvalued, at least compared to prior years. So to summarize, when you hear a price to book of two, that means the value of the company is equal to two times its equity. So the price to book is how much the market values every dollar of a company's equity. And it's a great ratio to use for banks and insurance companies, but it can be used for other sectors as well. And remember the price to book is using the balance sheet. So if you're investing in a company that has a lot of off balance sheet items, it may be hard to use the price to book to value them because a company cannot internally generate goodwill. If you acquire another company, then you can get goodwill in your balance sheet because when you acquire a company for more than it's worth, the excess is goodwill. Like Coca-Cola's brand name is not on their balance sheet. That carries a lot of weight when you invest in Coca-Cola. Because if you invest in another company that sells cola, they don't have that name of Coke. They have their own name, which is not as well known as Coca-Cola. Companies like Microsoft, especially when they first started out, they had a lot of intellectual property. All the code they wrote and everything in Bill Gates' head was a huge asset, but it wasn't on a balance sheet. So if you're investing in a friend's company, that doesn't have much on their balance sheet, but you're investing in a brilliant friend who has amazing ideas, you have to consider that, but you may invest in another friend that has hard assets on their balance sheet like real estate, but that other friend may be bad at running a business even though their balance sheet looks better. So there's more to investing than just price to book. You have to apply it with a lot of other ratios and a lot of other due diligence. I hope you learned something new in this video. Please leave a like, a comment, subscribe. Talk to you soon.